reading this morning is from the Gospel of John in chapter 17, verses 13 through 21. John 17, 13 through 21. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. I bring you greetings from the Church of Christ in Thermopolis, Wyoming, where I was just one week ago today concluding a gospel meeting that had started on the previous Wednesday. And I also bring you greetings from the Mountain View Church of Christ in Buena Vista, Colorado. They pronounce it Buena, not Buena. And so they send you their greetings, and that was where we were able to spend some time this last week and we're able to worship and study with the saints on Wednesday night. So we had some good travels, but we're glad to be back home. Two weeks ago, when I was here last, we started breaking down what we truly call the Lord's Prayer in Scripture. And CJ, pardon me, I'm going to have to... Clicker is still there from another time. But we were talking about the Lord's Prayer, the true Lord's Prayer in John 17, and we had taken a look at the first 12 verses of John chapter 17, and we're going to now take a look at a new section of Scripture from that passage of Scripture. I want us to begin this morning with some of the words of Paul, as Paul spoke in Romans chapter 10 and verse 1 to the church at Rome. He said, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. This was Paul's desire for the saints in the first century that they indeed remain in the faith and be true to their salvation and be found worthy in the end. We also see Jesus with this same attitude in John 17. In the first 12 verses that we took a look at two weeks ago, we took a look at the focus that Jesus had in the introduction of that prayer and the relationship and the oneness that he had with God and the desire that we be one with them. This next section of scripture focuses largely on the disciples, Jesus' care and concern for his students, for their well-being, especially after he would leave them. So this morning, we're going to take a look at the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer that's revealed for us in John 17. We're going to take a look at verses 13 through 21 as we look at part two of our three-part analysis of this offering to the Father. If we take a look at this lesson, I almost wanted to say there were, it was almost like four movies. And I know that may be a strange thing to think of or maybe even to make a comparison to, when it comes to Jesus praying. But it's almost like there are four episodes that are taking place throughout this next body of scripture. And in each of these, there is a plot, there is a purpose, there is a plan. Um, there, In some of them, there is the rescue of the disciple. There is the, the desire that they be preserved and that they be watched over. And so there is everything in this aspect of Jesus's prayer that is very exciting. It's very interesting. It's great to see his love for them. It's great to see his love for us. So this morning, I want us to take a look at four areas that Jesus prayed for his disciples in this next body of scripture. And the first one begins very simply 
in verse 13. When Jesus makes the statement, but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves, I want you to think about that for just a second and I want you to ask yourself this question. How joyful was Jesus? Now we always talk about how joyful we should be or ought to be. We are reminded of all the blessings that we are given. We are reminded of the fact that we are in Christ, Christians by the calling, and as such, we have the hope of eternal life. We have a lot of reasons to rejoice, and as Paul would once say, rejoice always or rejoice all the time. And so there are reasons why certainly uh, we would understand our joy, but that wasn't my question. My question was how joyful was Jesus? Think about this for just a moment. Jesus was God. We look forward to dwelling in heaven. He already had. He understood what ultimate glory was. He understood what it was like to be with his Father in that glory for all of eternity. He understood absolute goodness, absolute perfection. He understood absolute power and authority. He literally had and continues today to have all of those things and all of those things in the fullest capacity one could ever experience. This is why I say to you, look very carefully at what Jesus actually prays in verse 13. He says, now I come to you, he's talking to the Father, and he says, and these things I speak, those are the things that we talked about in the previous 12 verses the unity, the oneness, and, and what he had prayed in the prayer thus far. These things I speak in the world so that they, this is perhaps the world in general as an opportunity, but it is certainly his disciples in particular who were following him. I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. In other words, if you've ever heard a child of God talk about the peace that passes all understanding, one of the blessings that we find only in Christ, a peace that can take us through all circumstances, no matter how happy or sad. Well, there is a joy that is not the emotion of happiness that kind of comes and goes. There are times when we're happy and times that we're sad, but there is a joy that we can have in all times, and that comes from God. And Jesus is literally praying to the Father that the joy that he has in the fullest capacity one could have it, that we could experience that as well. He doesn't want us to experience it on a limited basis. He wants us to experience it in the fullest way that we can. And ultimately, we'll know the absolute fullness of his joy in eternity. But we can have a part of that right now. We can have a growing part of that right now. And this is Jesus' prayer, that we have his joy and that his joy be made full in ourselves. So brethren, let me say, if we're going to walk around with the joy of Jesus, then we're going to have to behave differently. We're going to have to talk differently and walk differently. We're going to have to smile differently, which means sometimes you have to start by actually smiling. Now, I realize behind masks, that's awfully hard to do. Uh, but uh, but it's, it's, it's something that we've learned. I, I've forgotten the term that my kids were talking about the other day, but they were talking about how we, we're having the, in this day and age to learn how to smile with our eyes. And so that's something that we do. But we need to let people know that there's joy in us. We need to let people know that there's something different about us. And so that is the joy that we see. In John chapter 15 and verse 11, Jesus made a very similar statement earlier, just two chapters ago, when he said, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Brethren, don't limit the joy of the king in your life. Don't put a limit on how much joy you feel, how much joy you express, how much joy you share with other people. Jesus never did with us, and if we truly wanna have that joy and let other people understand what they can have from that joy, we have to be that joy in every way. 
So that means, yes, that we need to smile even in bad times. Yes, we need to help people even when maybe we're busy doing something else. Yes, we need to show people that we care when nobody else does. We need to show the full joy of Jesus alive and well in our lives. A second area that Jesus prayed for his disciples we find in verses 14 and 15. And it is here that he prays for their protection. Jesus once again is praying to the Father. And he says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Now, we're accustomed to hearing that phrase, we are in the world, but not of the world. And a lot of that comes from Jesus' prayer here in John 17. But I want you to notice what he says. He says, I've given them your word. I have given them the truth, in other words. I have given them your will for their lives. And guess what? The world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Jesus had already warned on a previous occasion, once again in John 15, that this was going to be their response if they were disciples of Christ. If they were disciples of the Lord and they carried his truth, his gospel message into the world, that was going to be a problem. John 15 verses 18 through 21 reads, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember, the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. In John 17, Jesus is praying to the one who sent him. He is talking to the Father. And he is talking to the Father about what he has done and what has resulted in his deliverance of the truth to these disciples. The world has hated them. Why? Because they may be in the world, but they're not of the world. Their citizenship is somewhere else. Their eternal home is somewhere else. And they are moving through this land and through this time with the ultimate eyes on the horizon of heaven. In verse 15, Jesus would pray, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. This is very similar language to what Jesus prayed in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13. What is often, as we mentioned, referred to as the Lord's Prayer, but maybe would more accurately be called the model prayer. But it is here that Jesus concludes this lesson to his disciples in prayer by praying and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil some translations say from the evil one for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen the idea here is whether we're talking about evil in general or the evil one meaning the, the devil or satan in particular the idea is father help the disciples protect the disciples from all of the evil, bad influences that are in the world. Now, he's not going to keep us from the evil influences in the world. If there were no temptation, then we would not really be free moral agents, would we? We would not be choosing between good and evil. But while we're here, protect us. It's just like parents protecting their children today. We cannot prevent them from every problem they're going to face, but we can sure, certainly help them to move past many of them. If you've ever seen somebody who safe proofs their home for their small children, I've never understood how exactly you do that. Now I agree, it's probably a good idea that you put those little covers over the outlet so that they don't jam a fork in it and electrocute themselves, I get that. But if you're going to try to soften every corner that's out there, if you're going to try to pad every floor that they might fall on, uh, good luck with that. Sometimes people hit a corner. Sometimes kids fall down. Sometimes they get bumps and bruises. And so as a result of that, we realize we can't do everything for them. And part of falling down is learning how to get up. 
And so we teach them, we mold them, we shape them, we protect them. But at the same time, we have to allow them to do what they're going to do. A healthy respect for evil and temptation is important. Psalm chapter 141 and verse 4, the psalmist writes this. He says, do not incline my ear to any evil thing to practice the wickedness with men who do iniquity. And do not let me eat of their delicacies. This song, which in a way is a prayer in song to God, is simply saying, I have the freedom to choose my paths, but please help me to make the right ones. Please help me fo focus on what is good. Please help me turn away from what is wrong. Please help me to practice the things that are righteous, not the things that are wicked. He even uses that last phrase almost like we're eating a meal. He says regarding evil, don't let me sit down at that table and eat of what it offers. It will only do me harm in the end. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 19 reads, When anyone hears the words of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. You might recognize this verse of scripture from the parable of the sower, where a sower goes out and sows seed on four different types of soil, of wayside soil and then thorny soil and rocky soil and then good soil. In this particular part, we see the seed that is thrown on the wayside soil or the pathway soil. It's the kind of soil that you've seen packed down because so many people walk on it that if you threw seed out there, it would probably never take. It would never penetrate into the dirt where it could grow. And as a result, birds that come by and fly through the air, they see that seed and they pick it up as food. And so, so the seed never does what it was intended to do by the sower. In this one little verse of scripture in Matthew 13, 19, I think we see what Jesus is praying for his disciples. He's praying that they live in faith, that the seed of their faith penetrates their hearts and grows into something that is good. And Jesus' prayer to the Father is don't let anything come and take that seed out of their hearts. Don't let anyone come and take that truth away from them so that they might be lost. But rather protect them in such a way that they might grow in the faith and be prosperous in the end. Let's take a look at the third area that Jesus prayed for, and that was for their purification, for his disciples' purification. Now, the word purify is not necessarily used there, but a similar word is, and it's the word sanctify. And we often talk about that word sanctify means to set apart. But in this particular passage of Scripture, the idea here is it is the setting apart from the sin of the world, setting apart in purity. Notice what Jesus says. He continues to say in verses 16 and 17, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Then Jesus goes into verse 17, a very memorable, a very quotable passage of Scripture. He says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So if the truth is the word, Jesus is saying sanctify or set them apart in the truth. Purify them in the truth. Keep them clean in the truth. Well, let's talk about that for just a moment. How is it that when somebody is dirty, how is it that they get clean? Well, typically they take a bath, and that usually involves soap and water. It's that soap and water that helps to keep them clean, helps to, to remove the filth of the flesh. Well, I want you to consider, spiritually speaking, what is it that allows you to even know how to be clean? What is it that teaches you what is right versus what is wrong? What is it that teaches you how you should walk versus how you should not, should not walk except for the word of God? The truth. The book or the tablet or the cell phone or the electronic device that you have in your hand that contain the pages of the word of God. That truth. That's what tells us what is right and what is wrong according to God. And it is that that allows us to be different. It is that that allows Jesus to, to put us in a different category when we respond to that gospel call. Because when we obey that truth, when we live in that truth, we will, by virtue, be different. Not only different from the choices that we are making to live better lives for the Lord, 
but the differences that the Lord makes in us through the forgiveness of our sins, through the grace that is offered to us, through being taken out of the world and placed into the light of the Lord, into the body of Christ, which is the church. It is that opportunity that we get to go to heaven one day. That is what makes us different. It's knowing that truth. And Jesus prays that we would be set apart, that we would be purified in that truth. Psalm chapter 19 verses 7 through 14 talks about how great God is and how great his truth is and how changing it can be in our lives. The psalmist writes in chapter 19 and verse 7, the law of the Lord, that's talking about the word of God, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That is a fantastic passage of scripture. We should probably all hang on our refrigerators, put on the dashboard of the car. Make sure you don't cover up the speedometer. We don't want you speeding. But put it on the dashboard of your car or somewhere where you can read it often because this talks about how great the word is and how the truth can change us. can change us in so many good ways right here and right now, but so many other ways that will take us into that eternal life to come. Paul makes the statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. He talks about some people who did not know the truth, then were introduced to that truth, and were changed as a result of that truth. He says to the church at Corinth in chapter 6 and verse 9, he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now these are people who either do not know the truth and thus are not set apart by it, or who know the truth and reject the truth and thus are not set apart by it. He says, do you not know that those kind of people, people who make those kinds of choices, are not going to inherit the kingdom of God? But notice what Paul says to the church at Corinth. Even in the letter that he writes to them where they're doing a lot of things that are wrong, he says to them, this is not who you are. This is not where you should be. He says, verse 11, such were some of you. You used to be in the dark or you used to be in rebellion, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Now notice those three things that are mentioned, but you're washed. Washed how? Washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. Uh, sanctified, set apart, or purified from your sins. And that, of course, makes you justified, it says here. And as we always like to remember, the word justified means just as if I had never sinned. By coming in contact with the blood of Jesus that purifies and sets us apart from others, we are justified or just, it's just as if I'd never sinned. We are brought back into the relationship with God that was damaged and damaged eternally, permanently, because of our sin, but for the blood of the Lamb. Such were some of you, but not anymore. Now we behave differently. If you take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, the Apostle Paul writes a little verse of Scripture to the church at Thessalonica. And he says to them very simply, he says as he concludes, gets ready to close out this letter, he says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify, set you apart, 
make you different, purify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, what Jesus is praying for here is our complete and total sanctification, our complete and total purification from anything that would hurt us in this life and pre prevent us from the eternal life to come. Well, let's take a look at the fourth and final area that Jesus prayed for regarding his disciples. And that is in verses 18 and 19 when he prayed for their example. He himself, by the way, being that example. Take a look at verse 18 and 19. Jesus says to the Father, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Now, Jesus didn't send them ill-equipped. You might remember that he sent them out on their limited commission and now he is soon going to send them out on their great commission. But each time he doesn't do so without what they needed uh, He, in their limited commission. He prepared them and had them take with them those things that they would need for the journey and need for the work. And he does the same thing for us today. He prepares us and equips us to go into all the world to preach the gospel to all of creation. Now, in verse 19, although he says, I've sent them into the world, he says, for their sakes, for his disciples' sakes, for his followers' sake, I sanctify myself. Now, does that mean that Jesus was purified from all sin? Well, of course not, because he never sinned. He wasn't set apart from the filth of the flesh or, or the lusts of the world because he never had any filth or lusts in any kind of evil, sinful way to be sanctified of. But what he's saying is, I demonstrate by my life. I demonstrate by the things that I teach. I demonstrate by the examples that I give. I demonstrate what it means to be different. I demonstrate what it means to be pure and holy in the eyes of the Father. And I also demonstrate what it means to be pure and holy in their eyes so that they can have that perfect example to follow. He said, for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. Why are you who you are? And I'm not talking just spiritually speaking. I'm talking about in lots of different ways. Why is it that you dress the way that you dress? Why is it that you go and do the things that you do? Is it because maybe you have some of the same interests, some of the th same uh, common values that perhaps maybe your mom and dad raised you with or maybe because you have some very close friends that are great influences on you for good and perhaps sometimes even for the bad. Well, spiritually speaking, it's the same here. Jesus has given us a, a cardboard cutout, spiritually speaking, of the exact pattern to follow. Jesus is that perfect example. And it is a very, very true statement that if you don't know what to do in a situation, ask the question, what would Jesus do? It really does put a lot of clarity on the question. In fact, I've found that sometimes when I've asked that question, what would Jesus do? I have no problem picturing in my mind just exactly what Jesus would do. What I have a problem wrestling with is, yeah, but I really didn't want that to be the answer. I was really kind of hoping that would go the other way. But Jesus gave us the greatest example of just exactly how to live in this world, how to carry ourselves, how to conduct ourselves, the kind of attitudes that we should have and the kind of deeds that we should do. For their sakes I sanctify myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in the truth. I have demonstrated what it means to be set apart from this world so that they can do it successfully as well. It's interesting that in the third epistle of John, the third letter of John, not the gospel that we're currently studying, but later in the New Testament, uh, first and second and third John, Jude and Revelation. So you're talking about just two books before the book of Revelation and the end of the Bible. John writes a little one-chapter letter. It's very short. Not as short as 2 John, but short enough. And it's in this letter that he talks about some of these things. He talks about some of the, the, the 
things that come about from good examples, and he talks about some of the things that come about from bad examples. And he says, be mindful of both. Be aware of both so that you are not led astray down a path that would not be pleasing to God. John writes this letter to someone by the name of Gaius, and he starts off in verse 1 by saying the elder, John was an elder in the Lord's church, he says, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. Now listen to verse 3. For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth. That is how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers. And they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men, so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. It's all about reputation. And Jesus had created the perfect reputation and now you see John writing about others who are walking in his footsteps, who are following that same path and that same reputation. But then the story changes. In verse 9, John writes, I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. And of course, he's talking about the apostles, not just John, but those who had been hand-selected by Jesus to lead the ministry in the first century. Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either. And he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. When I read this passage of Scripture, I read about, or I think about, a congregation in a state northern to us that had a problem with a gentleman in the congregation who was very much a diatrophies. He liked to be the center of attention. He liked to be the one in power. And the fact that he actually and personally held the deed to the property on which the church building sat didn't help things either. Because at one point in time, because he didn't agree with some of the teaching that was going on, he said, you either teach what I tell you to teach or y'all can all leave because I own this property outright. That's certainly not the attitude of Christ. That's certainly not the attitude of our Savior. That's certainly not the example that he left for us. The example that he left for us was to be clear and to teach truth, to help those who are helpless, to save those who need saving. But by the way, he also rebuked those who needed rebuking. And John says here, when I get there, I'm going to deal with matters. I'll talk to Diotrephes. In fact, I'll confront him to his face. He says, I will call the attention that is necessary to his deeds that he does. And he describes exactly what's going on because what Diotrephes was doing was not following the example of Jesus, but following the example of self. In the very last verse, verse 11, John says to Gaius and to all other Christians who would read this letter, including us today, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. When you look at Jesus, you don't see evil. I don't know how anyone would ever say that anything Jesus represents in the remotest way represents evil. Because everything that he did was right. It was good. It was pure. And it was the perfect example for us in both attitude and in action. As Jesus prays for his disciples and prays in these four ways regarding his disciples, he then concludes the passage with two verses where he says to the Father, he says, Father, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, meaning those disciples right there in his presence not far from him, but also for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Brethren, he's talking about us. 
He's not just talking about followers of the first century. He's talking about followers of the 21st century. He's talking about those of us who would listen to that truth and be changed by it, who would strive to walk in newness of life and in the paths of righteousness despite the temptation of the world and the evil one who is constantly trying to bring us down. Jesus wants us to be pure as God in heaven is pure. You remember how John would write that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all? That's what he wants us to strive for. We may not be successful in it all the time. We may make our fair share of mistakes. But pleasing God means getting right back on track and making things right so that ultimately and in the end, we will hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your reward. This morning, ask yourself this question. Is Jesus praying for you? Does Jesus even today want what is best for you? And that is salvation in this life and salvation in the life to come. Because if you don't know the answer to that question, let me just go ahead and give you a hint. The answer is yes. He wants that for you. He wants that. He wanted it so much that he gave his life. He wants it so much that he continues to be patient, hoping that all will come to repentance, that all will come to salvation. So this morning, if you're not a child of God, that is what he is waiting for very patiently right now. For you not to put off till tomorrow what you can do today, but so that you will take the faith that you have in Christ Jesus. Repent of your sins. Confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit so that you can receive the forgiveness of sins. If you are a child of God, remember, that's what a disciple is supposed to be. Someone who follows him, a, a Christian, someone who is like Christ. And so we want to consider, are we helping Jesus to answer this prayer? By separating ourselves from the world, by, by fleeing from things that are evil and, and unwise. Are we striving to be pure and sanctified ourselves? We need God's protection, but are we making the choices that he gives us the freedom to choose that will keep us on the paths that are right? Are we following the example of Jesus? When somebody looks at us, do they see the example of Jesus? I hope so. I think most of you know that when I travel in the airport most of the time, as I did yesterday, I'm usually wearing one of my church shirts. I've told you before that, I, that some pl places may not want you to preach to them, but I know for sure that the people in line behind me are going to read the verse of Scripture on the back of my shirt, that's for sure. But on the front of that shirt, sometimes that's the scarier part. That's where they see you. That's where they see the look on your face. That's the, where they hear the words in your voice or maybe see the attitude in your demeanor. And the front of that shirt is the part that says, Church of Christ. I have to remind myself... I'm not only striving to be like Christ, I'm advertising that I'm his. So the question is, do people have to be talked into believing that? Do they have to be convinced that you're a Christian? Or did they know that before they ever even read the shirt? Did they see Christ living in you? I hope that's what they see in me. I hope that's what they see in you. But brethren, if you're unsure if you're not crystal clear that when somebody looks at you, they're seeing someone different, someone that Jesus prayed to the Father that he would help be different, then maybe there's a, something in your life that you need to change. And maybe that's certainly, or I should say, certainly that's something God can help you with. Go to him in prayer. But maybe that's something we can help you with as well. Maybe we can study the Bible with you a little bit better, raise your awareness a little bit more fully. Maybe you can strive to be that example just a little bit better. If we can help you to do that, we're always ready and willing to help. Just let us know how we can pray with you, encourage you, uh, give you a shoulder to cry on, uh, some kind of strength and encouragement. Let us know how we can help you as we all strive to be the fulfillment of Jesus' prayer as together we stand and sing.